Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. The committee will be in order. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fan, Professor Fan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the political developments in the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, especially as they relate to democracy and human rights since the death last year of the late Prime Minister Mela Zenawi. With your permission, I'll present a summary of my analyses on these questions and ask that my prepared statement be entered into the record. Without an objection, yours and all the other distinguished witnesses and any attachments they would like will be made part of the record. Thank you. In addressing Ethiopia's political evolution, and there has indeed been a shift, even if at times the changes have been rather subtle, it's incumbent upon us to recall the enormous importance of Ethiopia, both in its own right and relative to the national interests of the United States in Africa in general and in the geopolitically sensitive Horn of Africa in particular. That context is especially important if any of the resulting proposals are to be relevant, realistic, and perhaps most importantly, strategic in the fullest sense of the term. Moreover, while it's perhaps too soon after the passing of the late Ethiopian Prime Minister to either have sufficient time or requisite historical perspective to render anything approaching a definitive judgment on the man and his legacy, it's worth the effort to at least establish some context by recalling just how far Ethiopia has come since the overthrow of Mengistu Haile Mariam's Soviet client regime in 1991. One does not have to agree with all or even any of the specific policy choices made by the Ethiopian government during the last two decades to nonetheless acknowledge the historic achievements, including the peaceful succession of Eritrea in 1993, the introduction of legally recognized linguistic pluralism and ethnic federalism in 1994, and the economic miracle of one of the fastest growing economies in Africa and indeed the world in recent years, which notwithstanding the struggle that life remains for many Ethiopians has nonetheless lifted millions of others out of abject misery in just a generation. And if it's too soon to properly judge the legacy of the late Prime Minister Meles, it certainly is premature to attempt to render anything beyond a very initial assessment of his successor, Haile Mariam Dessalane, who was only confirmed by Parliament in his prime ministerial tenure uh, on a permanent basis on September 21, 2012, and subsequently elected as chairman of the EPRDF by the Congress of the Governing Coalition held by Ardar in the last week of March of this year. That being said, however, there are several positive and indeed tantalizing indications that while the new Prime Minister has promised to maintain his predecessor's policies, he is also slowly blazing his own trail. These include a cabinet reshuffle that rebalance uh, the representation within the governing coalition, an offer recently reaffirmed by UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon to open a dialogue with Eritrea without preconditions, a crackdown on corruption that's included the arrest of the ministerial rank director general of the Ethiopian Revenues and Customs Authority, and the recent allowing, as other witnesses have indicated, of the largest anti-government demonstration since 2005, an event which I've been assured by senior officials can and will be allowed to reoccur as long as the organizers give local authorities sufficient notice in order to make necessary logistical accommodations. To these modest points of data, I would add a brief personal observation from having had, even before he became Prime Minister, the privilege of discussing a broad range of issues with Haile Mariam Dessalane. He, he is a man of great intelligence, and he's cognizant of the challenges before him. On the other hand, one should also be recognize the political, institutional, and other constraints which someone in his position faces, especially until such time as he's able to win an electoral mandate in his own right. With all this in mind, permit me to conclude by commending to the subcommittee's consideration five principles to guide U.S. policy toward Ethiopia, which I offer in line with the prudent norm embraced by President Obama in last year's U.S. strategy toward Sub-Saharan Africa. Addressing the opportunities and challenges in Africa, the President wrote, requires a comprehensive U.S. policy that is proactive, forward-looking, and that balances our long-term interests with near-term objectives. So first, understand that Ethiopia is an ancient country populated by proud peoples imbued with a deep sense of history and nationhood, all of which has a profound impact on the current political reality. 
Secondly, recognize both the opportunities within the historic moment and the delicate balance that needs to be maintained. One should be leery of any actions which might upset the careful political balance being struck. Thirdly, be realistic about what the United States can and cannot do with respect to the direction of social, economic, and political developments in Ethiopia. It goes without saying that America has influence, and where possible, that influence should be brought to use judiciously for good. However, our room for maneuver is tighter than ever, and America's overall leverage significantly di diminished by the combination of our own general cutbacks in foreign assistance. When one looks at the actual figures, there's virtually nothing that's discretionary that could be cut back in our aid to Ethiopia, and the emergence of other countries and actors able and willing to work with the Ethiopian government, as witnessed by the Prime Minister's visit last week to China. Fourth, take advantage of Ethiopia's application to join the World Trade Organization to constructively engage with the country's government, not only about economic liberalization, but other rule of law and governance concerns. Even if the publicly stated goal of completing a session by 2014 is unlikely to be achieved, the effort does present the United States and other international partners with a unique opportunity for a more intense dialogue with their Ethiopian counterparts, contributing to the enhancing of technical and administrative and regulatory capabilities and advanced policy objectives ranging from liberalizing the banking and telecommunication sectors to securing private property and other legal rights. And fifth, become more engaged in Ethiopia's rapidly transforming higher education sector. Ethiopia has gone from having three national universities in 2001 to 31 this year. If the United States government could encourage American colleges and universities to become more engaged with their Ethiopian counterparts, there's the prospect over the long term of considerable return, both in terms of consolidating the cultural and political bonds between our countries and people, as well as advancing democratic and human development. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Bass, it goes without saying that there are a number of things one might wish to see done differently, perhaps even better, with respect to the ongoing social, economic, and political development of Ethiopia. Nevertheless, the context in which the post mellis transition and other developments are occurring needs to be taken into account and objective progress, both in absolute terms and relative to the rest of a very troubled but geopolitically strategic region. In that perspective, it behooves us to keep in mind Voltaire's warning, the le mieux est l'ennemi du bien, uh, the best is the enemy of the good, and allowing a healthy dose of political realism about our own interests and those of the peoples of Ethiopia to temper judgmentalist impulse and direct our energies instead where they can be most effective in encouraging, facilitating, and sustaining continued stability and progress in Ethiopia and beyond. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Dr. Pham, thank you very much.